Adam made no answer. Townsend leaned forward, his voice growing gentle, even paternal. You have ambition. I applaud that. You want to make your mark on Bow Street and the world. Excellent. But what you can't see is you are running the risk of destroying yourself. Now I have given you every chance. I have moved heaven and earth to avoid sacking you. But even with the king's goodwill towards you, I am running out of excuses to keep you around. I've tried again and again to guide you, Townsend told him earnestly. If you want to climb the ladder, there are ways. Look at me. He spread his arms wide. My father pushed a barra. I sold carrots and potatoes over a barrel in the market before I joined the runners. Now I have all that I could have imagined and more. And a family. Mrs Townsend is worth a small fortune, and I don't mean in money. A man is nothing without a good home, and that means a good wife who understands the way of the world and can support him on his way. Now, you and this Miss Thorne, Adam stiffened. I admit she would not be my first choice for you, Townsend went on. She's an eccentric. That seldom looks well for an officer, but she's very well placed with some of our most highly regarded families. And there are few doors that do not open to her. So I can understand why she'd be your choice. But a man cannot count solely on his wife to entirely smooth the way for him. You must make some kind of effort to show the right people that they can depend upon you. Have I ever failed to follow the law, sir? Adam inquired softly. Of course not. But there is more to what we do than the law. Think about this practically, Arkness. Suppose you find Beecham and prove that he was working on Stafford's orders and that Edwards was in the government's pay, what then? Suppose you even prove that he went so far as to kill Edwards to silence him. Do you know what you become then? Townsend did not wait for an answer. You become the reason that the Cato Street trial fails. If that happens, not only is your career over, but I may not be able to stop you from being taken up for conspiracy and maybe even treason. Townsend sat back. That's why I wanted you here tonight. I wanted you to understand what you're throwing away with this mania of yours. You will lose all possibility of a good, solid life. He gestured with his glass, indicating the house and all it held. And more! You will lose the respect of your comrades, the regard of your king, Harkness. And what do you gain? The possibility of your neck in a noose? Townsend drank down his wine and slapped the tumbler back down onto the table. If you are not willing to save yourself, think about what being associated with a convicted traitor will mean to your family. And, Mr Harkness, Townsend leaned forward, to your Miss Thorne. Chapter 47 The Evening's Unwelcome Revelations The species of alarm which she had felt at this discovery opened her eyes effectually to the state of her own heart. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda Is there anything more you might need, miss? asked the footman as he helped Rosalind down from Charlotte's enclosed carriage. Madame's instructions were that we should remain at your disposal. One thing had not changed about Charlotte. She remained impervious to Rosalind's arguments when they went against her own inclinations. So Rosalind was sent home not only with carriage and driver, but a footman in case of emergencies. For a single intense moment, Rosalind thought to ask the footman to carry a message to Adam. After today's revelations, Rosalind desperately wanted to feel his arms around her and to hear his calm, sensible voice as she tried to untangle all that she had learned. It was disturbing to find she needed him so much. She had never needed one other person, not since she was a girl. No, Rosalind corrected herself. She had never permitted herself the luxury of such need. She had deliberately created and maintained her independence as a matter of pride and self-protection. But Adam had his own worries, and he would be here soon enough. She had just opened her mouth to send the carriage away when it struck her that something was wrong. 
It was already full dark, but the lamp beside the door was unlit. No light shone upstairs either. The drapes on the front window were firmly closed, so she could not see for certain whether a light burned there. Rosalind's mouth went dry. Please wait, she said. There may yet be something more tonight. The man bowed and did not straighten until Rosalind had opened her front door. The foyer was dark. Amelia did not come running. Rosalind's disquiet deepened. The only light she could see was in the parlour. Voices emerged as well, indistinct but very familiar. Alice, Amelia, Mrs Singh. Uncertain whether she should be worried or irritated, Rosalind pushed open the parlour door. Rosalind, cried Alice, you're late. I was beginning to worry. Rosalind heard her, but the words barely registered. Instead, she stared at the pile of shining colour gleaming on the tea table. It was as if someone had shattered a stained glass window and made a heap of the shards. Slowly, Rosalind realised that their entirely unremarkable tea table was covered in jewels. She tried to walk forward normally, but she staggered and found her breath quite gone. Oh dear, murmured Alice. Amelia ran forward to help Rosalind off with her coat, gloves and bonnet. Rosalind went through the motions mechanically. She could not tear her eyes away from the blazing heap on the table. There was a sapphire and diamond necklace, a pearl bracelet, an emerald brooch and several rings, all trimmed with diamonds and set in figured gold. Rosalind could barely begin to guess how many thousands of pounds it all represented. She realised she was oddly dizzy and sat down abruptly. Yes, agreed Alice, coming to sit beside her. It is a bit of a shock, isn't it? What is all this? Rosalind cried. Amelia, it seems, has been busy, said Alice. So, as I'm sure you will not be surprised to hear, has Kate. Kate slumped on the stool beside the fireplace. Mrs Singh hovered over her, her posture making her appear something between a school matron and a turnkey. Rosalind swallowed and did her best to collect herself. Will someone please tell me how all these things have come to be in this house? Kate brought them with her, said Alice succinctly. They were in the valise that she asked Amelia to keep for her. That valise was stolen today by a woman named Francesca Finch. Rosalind felt herself frown. Yes, I think I would have trouble if I put that name in a novel. At any rate, Miss Finch is a housebreaker and pickpocket. Kate met her at a party in Bath when Miss Finch tried to steal her ring. It seems Kate had been pilfering from her family for some time before this. Amelia looked away. Kate stared after her in mute appeal. The silent exchange told Rosalind volumes about this activity Alice termed pilfering and who had been enlisted to help with it. Anger and pity both rose up in her. She pushed both away. She could sort through her emotions later. Alice continued, Miss Finch, who seems to know a good thing when she finds it, realised that she could make use of our Kate, not only as a hand in picking up trifles at the parties and balls of Bath society, but in helping sell things on to various jewellers and pawnbrokers who could be counted on not to ask too many questions of a gently bred young lady. Alice paused and glared at Kate. It seems Miss Finch had become rather too well known locally to get the best prices for her merchandise. Kate was staring into the fire, belligerence warring with resignation in her face. It seems that when Kate was getting ready to leave her aunt's house, she decided to fund her travels by not selling on the latest parcel of items Miss Finch had given her. Miss Finch, you may understand, was considerably agitated by this, having creditors of her own. She tracked Kate to our door and made her way inside. She stole the valise but reckoned without Amelia's resourcefulness and cunning. Alice, you're novelising murmured Rosalind. Oh, I am, aren't I? Sorry. Well, anyway, it seems Amelia guessed what was in the valise. She took the precaution of removing the jewels, and here we are. Rosalind picked up the sapphire necklace. 
Bright white diamonds surrounded six teardrop-shaped gems that hung from a diamond chain. The sapphires themselves glowed with a blue colouring so deep it was almost black. Rosalind was seized with a girlish impulse to clasp it around her own throat, just to know what it would feel like. How did this Miss Finch get inside? she asked. Where was George? she paused. Where is George? That appears to have been very bad timing, said Alice. Miss Finch and the news that Hannah had gone into labour arrived at the same time. Is there... Alice shook her head. Any word? Not yet. You can imagine I am a bit put out at this turn of events. Her sardonic tone belied the worry in her eyes. Rosalind laid the necklace down, smoothing her palm across the gemstones as if they were rumpled fabric. I must think, she instructed herself. I must deal with what is in front of me at this moment. Rosalind straightened her shoulders and turned to her cook. I am so sorry for what you have been through today, Mrs Singh. Everything is well in hand here. You may go home. We will talk more in the morning when we've all had a chance to rest. At this suggestion, Mrs Singh drew herself up to her full height. If you please, Miss Thorne, I'd rather not until the officers have been sent for. As it happens, there is a carriage outside awaiting orders, Rosalind told her. You may ask the men there to keep watch until Mr Harkness arrives. He is expected before too long. Very well, miss, if you say so. Mrs Singh curtsied and took her leave, but not before she gave both Amelia and Kate a long, hard look. When she was gone, Alice let out a long sigh. We're going to have to increase her wages. At the very least, said Rosalind. She turned to Amelia. Are you all right? Amelia nodded. Her eyes were red, but other than that she looked no worse for wear. Would you like to go to your room? If it's all the same, miss, I'd rather stay. Amelia lifted her chin. Alice nodded her approval. Kate just rubbed her hands together as if she had a chill she could not shake. Rosalind also nodded. From the way Alice had told her story, it was very clear she believed that Amelia bore little or no blame for the afternoon's unsettling events. Rosalind turned to Kate. Miss Leverton, she said, is there anything you would like to add? So you can pass sentence, do you mean? Kate grumbled. What is there to say? Yes, I worked hand in glove with Fran Finch for almost a year. I thought I'd left her behind when we moved from Bath, but she'd followed me to London. Harold had made his intentions known by then, and I tried to break it off. I meant to marry him, I did, she added as she saw the sceptical looks on their faces, and I didn't want Franny, Miss Finch, hanging about while I was trying to start over, and she told me she'd go if I sold on one more lot for her. Kate nodded at the shining heap. So, I said I was. I was waiting for my chance. But then... Aunt Mariana got sick and Harold was pushing to get a special licence so we could get married right away, and I... I decided I couldn't go through with it. Was that because you found out that Harold was carrying on a liaison with your sister-in-law? asked Rosalind. Alice's jaw dropped. So did Kate's, but she recovered more quickly. I should have realised you'd find that out, she muttered. And yes, I mean... I'm not a schoolgirl. I know men keep mistresses, and heaven knows I don't blame Mina for wanting somebody other than Marcus in her life. But it was just too much, she finished a trifle limply. It seems I was only ready to live out so many lies at once. Did Harold know you'd found out? Perhaps. I don't know. Did you tell Mariana? No. I was too busy working out how to leave. Rosalind watched Kate silently for a long moment. Did you know that Mr Davenport is Mariana's son? Good Lord! cried Alice. Who have you been talking to? Charlotte, said Rosalind. She remains rather well informed about the gossip around Bath. That's why I was late. Ah, of course. Alice folded her hands on her knees. Do go on. Kate got to her feet. Well, if you do plan to go on, you must excuse me. I am quite tired and I'd like to go back to my rooms. Miss Leverton, said Alice with deceptive mildness, 
Rosalind won't point this out, so I will. A Bow Street officer will be here shortly. Your future is very much dependent on what Rosalind and Amelia have to say about how this mass of jewellery got here. Kate bit her lower lip. Kate, said Rosalind, I understand that your situation is complicated and I do not blame you for looking for a means of escape. But there is something you do not yet know. At least I hope you do not. What is it? Your aunt has been poisoned. And so have you. Kate blinked. Her brow furrowed. Are you quite mad? I'm sorry to say that I'm not, Rosalind replied. Mrs. Leverton's illness was the result of arsenical poison. We are quite certain of this. The symptoms you exhibited when you came to us also point toward poisoning, although much more severe. But... but who? And for the love of all... Why? That is the question I have been trying to answer since you came to us. Kate shuddered violently and shook her head as if trying to clear it. I won't. I cannot. It cannot be true. I will not believe it. Rosalind did not even attempt to answer this. A dozen emotions chased each other across Kate's face as memories and possibilities tumbled through her mind. Why didn't you tell me this before? she demanded. Because the person responsible for Mariana's poisoning could well have been you. I... you believed this of me? She stared and she turned to Amelia. Did you believe it? Amelia said nothing, but her folded hands bunched into fists. I believed it was possible, replied Rosalind calmly. And what do you believe now? Kate demanded. I believe you have acted foolishly and desperately, but I do not believe you are a poisoner. Well, I suppose I must appreciate your confidence in my character, said Kate dryly. May I ask why not? Because to commit murder, one must believe there is no other option. You had already provided yourself with a means of escape. Rosalind gestured at the jewellery. You had no need or reason to poison Mariana or yourself. Kate buried her face in her hands and shuddered. How, how has any of this happened? Alice rolled her eyes and pulled a handkerchief from her sleeve. She pried Kate's hands from her face and pressed the kerchief against her palms. Here, do collect yourself. I apologise, murmured Kate. I cannot. I am not always as stoical as I am meant to be. I have only one more question, said Rosalind. Kate threw up her hands, exasperated, exhausted. What is it now? What do you want from all this? From all your efforts? And this? She gestured toward the glittering heap of jewels. What do you truly want? Kate held herself still for a moment, but her strength failed her slowly. Her shoulders slumped, her spine, her gaze grew distant seeing what was in her mind rather than the silent room around them. Not once did she even look at the jewels, let alone look at them with desire or longing. My freedom, said Kate. To go about my days without reference to anyone else's expectations of who I must be, without having to use or deceive anyone else because it is the only way to live. Rosalind turned to Amelia. Do you believe what she says? Without hesitation, Amelia nodded. Yes, Miss Thorne, I do. Very well. Kate's mouth curled into a sneer. And what, Miss Thorne, does that mean? It means that until we have reason to do otherwise, we will trust you. On a... Amelia's word said Kate, incredulously. Yes, snapped Alice, obviously at the end of her patience. Is that so hard to believe? Kate met Alice's gaze, and it was plain she saw the fire and the impatience. And yes, the love all shining there. No, Kate said. No, not at all. Before anyone had any chance to speak again, the sharp rap of the front door knocker cut through the room. 
Alice groaned in frustration and peeked through the draperies to see who might be knocking at this time of night. Rosalind, she said, that's Adam. I'll go, said Amelia. No, said Rosalind. It's all right, I'll go. She took up a candle and left the room. Let everyone have a chance to pause and to breathe, she thought. Starting with me. Chapter 48 Declarations Though she strongly felt the pain of this separation, yet she could not recede from her decision. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda Adam drew back, ever so slightly startled when he saw it was Rosalind who opened the door. Something was wrong. She saw it at once. It was in the set of his jaw as he stepped inside and took off his hat. Rosalind waited until he had hung hat and coat on the pegs by the door. What's happened? she asked softly. Adam looked past her toward the closed parlour door. I found my man, he told her, but he was dead. I'm sorry. Rosalind took his cold hand and held it. There was more than that. Even in the candlelight she could see his eyes were shuttered and his manner uneasy. Rosalind's heart constricted. But he did not give her a chance to talk. Instead, he reached out his free hand and traced the line of her cheekbone. You look as if you've had a hard time as well. She sighed and nodded. Adam raised a questioning brow. Rosalind hesitated, but only for an instant. Then, softly, she told him what had happened to Amelia, Alice, Kate and Mrs Singh while she was away following Wilhelmina Leverton and talking with Mariana. Adam's eyes went wide. Can you show me? Rosalind touched his sleeve. Adam, will you arrest Kate or Amelia? If she has done all you said, she should be arrested, he replied. And from what you say, Amelia has assisted her more than once. They will be hanged or transported, breathed Rosalind. A theft worth five pounds will send a person to the gallows. These jewels are worth a thousand times that. The more radical papers called it the bloody code, the more conventional persons insisted that the laws must be harsh to serve as a deterrent. Nonetheless, she is guilty, Adam, but mostly she is guilty of not being able to earn her way out of a family that rejected her. And Amelia... Amelia only wants to live. I know, said Adam. I do know. He took a deep breath. Trust me. Always. Rosalind stepped aside and let him precede her into the bright parlour. Hello, Alice. Miss Leverton, he said. Amelia. Kate, sitting on her stool by the fire, froze, stock still. Amelia's face blazed with anger. Rosalind tried to signal to her that all would be well, but if Amelia saw, she gave no sign. Adam did not let his attention linger on either of them. Instead, he walked straight to the table and he picked up the necklace Rosalind had laid out earlier and held it to the light. Hello, Adam, Alice said from her spot on the sofa. What do you think? Adam turned toward Amelia. She raised her chin, ready to spit back defiance. Alice's calm faltered just a little. I need to ask you a question, said Adam, and all I ask you to do is answer me truthfully. Amy, breathed Kate. Amelia did not so much as glance toward her. She simply nodded. You took these jewels from a woman named Fran Finch, inquired Adam. For a moment, Rosalind thought Kate might faint. Amelia was clearly confused by the question, but realisation dawned slowly. Yes, she said. They were hidden in a valise with a false bottom. She added no word about how the valise came into her possession. Tension sang through the room. Adam seemed not to feel it, however. He laid the sapphire necklace back down. As it happens, I recognise at least some of these pieces. He picked up the emerald brooch. It was made in the shape of a Brazilian parrot, with a pearl clutched in its beak. This one is unique, and caused quite a stir when it went missing, he turned. It is believed this Fran Finch was the thief. 
Any information about her whereabouts or her associates would be very welcome to Bow Street. Kate winced. Adam waited. Amelia quickly and sharply kicked Kate in the ankle. I might know something, Kate murmured. Possibly. Adam nodded. Would you know more if it could be promised your name would not be made public? I might, said Kate, slowly. Her gaze slid past him to Rosalind. Rosalind had no idea what the girls saw, but it must have satisfied her. I think so, yes. Very well, but that's for later. For now, you should know there's a rather substantial finder's fee on offer for their return. He smiled. I'm pleased to say that properly belongs to you, Amelia. He laid the brooch back down. Unless, of course, someone else wants to lay claim to it and can say how these jewels came to be in a valise that happened to come into your hands. He folded his hands behind his back and waited. No idea, said Amelia. Kate hesitated, but only for a heartbeat. Then she shook her head. Rosalind was conscious of an odd species of pride. She had seldom seen Adam in his character of an officer of the law. As much as she trusted him, she had not quite known what to expect. Now she felt it was absurd that she had not trusted him more. Alice clapped her hands sharply together. Well, that's all settled then, Amelia. I'm delighted for you, but it is late and I expect we are all going to have a long day tomorrow. Come on, let's get Kate up to bed. She's ready to nod off. She glared at Kate, daring her to disagree. Yes, thank you. Kate pushed herself to her feet. I find I am very tired. She curtsied to Adam and to Rosalind and let Alice marshal her out of the room. Amelia stayed behind. She looked to Adam. She looked to Rosalind. She bowed her head and dipped her curtsy and turned at once to follow Alice and Kate. The parlour door closed and Rosalind expelled a long breath. Alice never ceases to amaze, murmured Adam. How do you suppose she knew I needed to speak privately to you? Rosalind smiled. She can read your face almost as well as I can. She knows something's amiss. She paused. What is it, Adam? It's more than this man Edwards turning up dead. She did not mention that this meant the promised reward would have vanished with the man's life. She did not ask what the lack of that money would mean for Adam's offer of marriage. All of that could wait. Indeed, she felt sure it must wait. I am ordered to Liverpool tomorrow, said Adam. What for? asked Rosalind. He shook his head. I'm only told that the Lord Mayor of Liverpool has requested an officer and that I am to be that officer. This is, I gather, because of your meeting with Sir Richard and your involvement with the matter of George Edwards. Among other things, said Adam. Townsend has made it very clear he is saving me from myself. He paused. And saving you as well. You may thank Mr Townsend for his concern, but he should not trouble himself on my behalf, said Rosalind pertly. Adam smiled at this, but that smile quickly faded. What do you want to do? she asked. I want to do my duty, said Adam. I want to do right. I want to support my family as a man should. I want... But here words failed him. It was all right. Rosalind understood. Have you been home with this news yet? she asked. Not yet. You should go. It will give you time to think. Adam clearly considered this idea absurd. And leave you and Alice with thousands of pounds worth of jewels in the house? Not to mention Kate Leverton. This Miss Finch may come back for her goods. Kate Leverton is not a danger to us. But her presence may be. My sister's men will stay, said Rosalind. They are outside even now. I plan to ask them in any case. Alice needs to go to George. She felt a tiny smile form. It seems the baby has chosen now to make its appearance. I understand babies have uncanny timing, Adam said, but a footman and a coachman, these are my sister's men from her previous life as a courtesan. They are specifically employed to prevent her person or her house from being disturbed. You may rely on them. She hardly liked the idea of asking the men to spend a sleepless night on her behalf, 
But the fact was the house had already been breached once, in broad daylight. Adam's concern was not out of bounds. Very well, I yield the point. Adam placed his hand on his breast and bowed. Rosalind nodded in a show of imperious acceptance. She was glad he was able to joke. It showed that he understood that she was not sending him away because she regretted his presence the other night, or that his trust in her was in any way faltering. But neither did he move closer to her, even though they were alone. Indeed, she felt how very strongly he was holding himself back. Rosalind, he said, what do you think? Should I go to Liverpool? I don't know if I have an answer to that, she admitted. If I go, I am accepting that George Edward's death will be swept under the carpet, that there will be no inquiry into what role Stafford may have played in the business and that Jack Beecham will get off scot-free. Accepting and agreeing to it, he said bitterly. If I do not go, I lose my post and my pay, and if Stafford is frightened enough, I leave myself open to accusations of treason. He would do that because he is frightened. He would see it as his duty to the Crown to prevent me from interfering in the work of suppressing dangerous rioters, and Townsend may well stand by and let it happen, because he also believes it to be his duty, and because he will not risk his own reputation, and if it happens, my family will all suffer. You will suffer, he added softly. Rosalind's first instinct was to tell him not to worry about her, but that would be ridiculous. Of course he must worry. If what he said was so, if he really was risking a treason charge, she must worry for him and for herself. Society might excuse her the infraction of asking for money for her services, but if it became known she had a close association with a man charged with treason... No reputation, no matter how strong or well-established, could survive that. And yet, she herself could not, would not say so much in this moment. There was another, deeper, more important truth to be spoken. Rosalind laced her fingers through his. You must do what you know to be right, she told him. And when you are done... I promise you, Adam, that I will be here for you. Chapter 49 A Sleepless Night Treat me with sincerity and suffer me to be your friend. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda That night, when Rosalind carried her candle down to the parlour, she found she was not the only one left sleepless. Kate Leverton had drawn the round-backed chair up close to the hearth. She sat there with the poker in hand. As Rosalind watched, Kate viciously smacked one of the glowing coals to release a fresh burst of spark and flame. I couldn't sleep, Kate said, without looking away from the fire. Neither could I. Rosalind set the candle down on the tea table and pulled her shawl more closely about herself. She also lifted the edge of the drapes and peered outside. Charlotte's footman lounged beside the stoop, arms folded, but his head alert. Are we safe? asked Kate bitterly. It would seem. Rosalind let the drape fall and instead settled onto her usual place on the sofa. Alice had provided a bandbox to transport the jewellery to Bow Street. Rosalind had watched regret bleeding into Kate's expression as Amelia, with Alice's help, re-wrapped her trove and stowed it away. Alice had expressed her intention of using all the items as buried treasure in her next book. Amelia had laughed, and the two proceeded to trade increasingly elaborate descriptions for Alice to use. Kate had watched and held her tongue, and, Rosalind noted, swallowed her tears. I thought I was so clever, said Kate, to the tiny fire in front of her. I thought I would simply slip away and none would be the wiser. She waved the ashy poker at the empty air. I would set myself up as a fine, independent lady, just like Aunt Marianna, and drive my own carriage and ride horses and drink in the taverns and shock the world. 
She stabbed the poker deep into the fireplace ashes. I can't ride, she said, and I can't drive, and I hate beer. Despite everything, Rosalind felt herself smile. Not everyone is suited to a life as a bel esprit. She hesitated. Kate. Yes? Kate smacked another coal. Fresh sparks scattered. Rosalind resisted the urge to remind her if the house caught fire, Kate would go up in the conflagration with the rest of them. Did you know about Mr Davenport's parentage? Kate carefully put the poker back into the rack with the rest of the fire irons. Yes, she said simply. Aunt Marianna told me. Does Mr Davenport know? She nodded. It seems that when Uncle Colin died, Harold went and asked Marianna if he was Uncle's by-blow. It was a reasonable assumption. It was quite common for a man to take an orphaned child as a ward or apprentice. That way the man could provide for the child without having to acknowledge the blood relationship. It seems Aunt Marianna had talked Uncle Colin into being something of a blind for her, said Kate. If Uncle was the one who took up Harold to mentor and educate, everyone would assume Harold was his. No one would stop to think that he might actually be hers. She rubbed her hands together. Aunt Marianna is very good at that sort of manoeuvre. Is that why she wanted you to marry him? She said the marriage would be good for us both. We would have plenty of money, we could live as we pleased, and we'd be safe. From what? From Marcus, for one. He would have no way to gain control of me or any money she might give me, not even if he lodged one of his lawsuits, and possibly safe from my poor decisions, she added ruefully. By the law, it's easier for a husband to protect a wife than for a woman alone to protect herself. Rosalind was silent for a moment, acknowledging this truth. Do you think she knows about your thefts? It's possible, Kate sighed. Obviously, I never thought to ask her. But it would not surprise me to learn that's why we left Bath. I doubt she thought Fran would follow me. I certainly didn't, she added ruefully. She cares for you, said Rosalind. Yes, agreed Kate. Rather a lot, I think. After everything, she still wanted me found. She looked at her hands again. Why didn't you ask her to help you? Because I wanted to prove I could do it myself. Because I didn't want to depend on anybody, even Aunt Marianna. Her voice dropped to a whisper. Especially Aunt Marianna. Marcus and my father were always whining about what she owed the family, meaning what she owed them, of course, and when she wouldn't give over voluntarily, they tried to find ways to force her. I didn't want her to think I was like that. What of these friends in Edinburgh? The Wallaces. Do they exist? asked Rosalind. If this question surprised Kate, she gave no sign. They do, as it happens, but I very much doubt they will be glad to see me if my hands are empty. She stretched those hands out toward the fire and watched the play of light through her fingers. As has been pointed out to me, even in Edinburgh one is expected to pay for board and lodging, so I expect I will not be going to them. Then what do you wish to do? I don't know answered Kate. But it seems I will have to go home and face my aunt. Assuming we are able to discover which of my family tried to murder us both. She stopped. You do think it was someone in my family? Aunt does have other enemies. She spoke almost wistfully. I am afraid it must be family, said Rosalind. The timing of your illness makes it difficult for it to have been someone else. Unless you met with someone that last day you've not told me about. Kate shook her head. I was at home all day until dinner. I was putting on a show of being on my best behaviour. What happened at dinner? Kate lowered her hands. The dinner was a disaster. Marcus was full of himself, all insinuations and blame. He kept hinting how much I owed him, how I would ultimately need his permission to marry whether I was of age or not. There was also a great deal about how carefully Harold should step, lest he trip and fall. The candle flickered. Rosalind drew her shawl a little closer. Why did you leave in the middle of the night, she said, if you had planned to go anyway? Oh, that was because of Everett, said Kate. 
As Wilhelmina and I were getting up to go to the drawing room for tea, he caught up with me. He told me that Marcus was planning to... She swallowed. He said Marcus had bribed one of Aunt Mariana's maids. He said she told him about me and my... associates. That if Aunt Mariana did not give him what he wanted, he was planning to turn me over to the magistrates. And you believed this? Her smile was sharp. Oh, yes. It is exactly the sort of thing Marcus would do. No, I meant you believed Everett was telling the truth. It should be obvious that I did. I left the house that night. Kate narrowed her eyes at the fire. Do you think Everett was lying? About Marcus knowing something? It is possible, Rosalind said. He may have had his own reasons for wanting you out of the house. Everett was a peacemaker, but Everett was also a manipulator. Society was filled with such persons, the ones who presented the face of reconciliation and friendship, and quietly and sometimes underhandedly worked to arrange things in their own favour. Kate fell silent, and Rosalind did not move to ask her any more questions. Kate had done a great deal of harm. She had endangered Amelia and Alice with her schemes. But Rosalind was conscious of a sympathy for the young woman. Rosalind's own family had been broken, and her father outrageously selfish. Kate's family, however, was proving to be actively malicious. It was a deeply painful thing to have to come to grips with, no matter who one was or what one might have done. Into this silence trickled the sound of male voices from outside. Rosalind lifted the drapes again. In the lamplight she saw Charlotte's man was arguing with another. Both were gesticulating broadly. The new man pointed at a piece of paper in his hand... Rosalind's heart thumped. She snatched up the candle and hurried into the foyer. Kate followed close behind and hovered at her shoulder as Rosalind undid the bolt. Both men outside stopped their squabbling immediately. The new man snatched his cap off his head. "'What is it, Parsons?' Rosalind asked the footman. "'This fellow says he has a message for you, miss,' Parsons replied. "'Yes, I'll take it.' She held out her hand. Parsons' expression remained dubious but he passed her the folded note. There was no seal and no direction. Rosalind opened the paper and read. And her heart stopped. What is it? Kate leaned in close. I'm so sorry, breathed Rosalind, as Kate read and gasped. The note was from Mrs. Hepplewhite and very obviously written in haste. Miss Thorne, you are needed here. Word has come that Mr. Everett Leviton has fallen down the stairs and is dead. Chapter 50 Home Truths She suddenly left the dangerous shades and went to her mother to seek protection against herself. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda Dawn came slowly to London. Adam sat in front of his mother's hearth, the coals were banked, the air was chill. If he listened, he could hear the early morning sounds, the crow of a distant city rooster, the creak and slam of a nearby door, a voice shouting, another answering. The bells would soon toll the hour yet again. He'd made no move to go to bed, much less pack his bag to prepare for his journey to Liverpool. He'd just sat on the bench and watched the shifting glow of the coals beneath their blanket of ash, Footsteps came down the stairs, followed by an exasperated snort. Meg. Well, mother, here he is, his sister called up the stairs. And where else would he be? Their mother stumped down the stairs and bustled into the kitchen, with a face long as a winter's night, just like when he came in. As Mrs Harkness delivered this blunt assessment of her oldest son, she also took up the poker. Deftly, she began uncovering the coals and adding more fuel from the scuttle so that the fresh flames leapt up and spread. Come on, she slapped Adam's shoulder as she passed him. As you're up, you may as well make yourself useful. Bring the buckets. Adam didn't even think to protest. He just grabbed the two big wooden buckets that waited by the side door. His mother tucked the basket of crumbs and vegetable peelings under her arm and strode out into the yard. While Adam plied the pump, 
his mother scattered the feed for the chickens and geese. Now, she said, as she watched the quarrelsome fowls gathering for their meal, what's the matter? Nothing's the matter. Adam traded the full bucket for the empty one. Oh, yes, mother drawled. You just sat up all night because you'd nothing better to do. Try again, sir, she added sharply. All at once, Adam felt he was seven years old again and trying to hide an apple behind his back. Adam worked the pump handle a few more times. I've been ordered to Liverpool. Well, isn't it just as well I washed your good shirt? I've been ordered away to keep me out of trouble and to give me time to think about how much I need my post. His mother sighed. What have you been doing to pull Mr Townsend's nose this time? Ma, cried Adam, genuinely surprised. I don't pull his nose. Oh, no, of course not. Sarcasm filled each word. You pull his nose and kick his shins and do whatever else you can to make a nuisance of yourself where he's concerned. You make me sound like a boy acting out of spite. I never said so, she shot back. You just don't care for the way he does his job and you want to do better. So you get in his way as often as you can. Adam meant to protest, but his mother turned her sidelong glance on him, all but daring him to interrupt. Adam closed his mouth. And all your certainty and troublemaking has left him with no choice but to get you out of his way, she concluded. Adam stilled the pump handle, but he found he couldn't quite let go. You agree with him? I didn't say that either, Mother answered. But since you two are at such loggerheads, he has no more choice than you do. If you weren't as good at your trade as you are, my boy, you might have left him another way. But you're that good and you're that stubborn, and so there you both are. She shoved the empty feed pan into his hands. What does your Miss Thorne think of it? She leaves it up to me. All through the long night, the memory of her calm, trusting expression had stayed in front of him. The way she held his hand, the way she declared her acceptance of whatever choice he made. Mother waded through the milling birds to the nesting boxes. She would! When are you going to get off your heels and speak to her properly? Adam said nothing. Mother eyed him, even as she began carefully rifling the straw for eggs. Unless you've already spoken to her. I've spoken. She hasn't answered. At least, she's not said yes, Mother concluded. No, she's not. Will she? I don't know. Mother shook her head. I swear, sometimes I don't know which one of you I should rap on the knuckles first. Well, as I'm sure she asked you, what do you want to do? If I go to Liverpool, I'm going against my conscience, against the law, against... against what ought to be right, he said. If I stay, it could well be a bridge too far for Townsend and Stafford, not to mention Magistrate Burney and all their important friends. I could get the sack, and worse. And then what? His mother laid another brown egg into her apron and shrugged. Then you shake the dust off your heels and go on. But what about you? And now at last we come to it. She turned and her expression softened. You've looked after all of us for a long time now, Adam, she said. I've a bit put by. Tom's in work, Davy's sure to be advanced at his firm and Neddy's about to take up his position. We're fine, my son. If you need us to hold you up for a bit, then so be it. We're well able to take you on for a while, and while you're thinking on what I've just said, you might also think about putting your pride in your pocket and realising it's not only Mr Townsend who knows you're worth having about the shop. Adam bent and kissed her forehead. I love you, Ma. Get along with you, she patted his cheek. Do what you need to, and talk to your Miss Thorne. I've seen the two of you together. You'll bring things round. That was when Meg leaned out the side door. Adam? Visitor for you. His mother patted his cheek again. Adam ducked back into the house with mother and her apron full of eggs right behind him. There, in the kitchen, with his hat under his arm, stood Sir David Royce. Sir David, Adam exclaimed. Mr Harkness, Mrs Harkness. Sir David bowed to Adam's mother. Please excuse this early visit, ma'am. I've come for a word with your son. 
Well then, I shall leave you two to your business, Mother said genially. Come inside when you're done for a cup of tea. Sir David bowed as Adam's mother passed. Adam gestured that the coroner should join him in the yard. Once they were outside and Sir David had replaced his hat on his head, Adam asked, What can I do for you, Sir David? You can tell me what was behind the business with the dead man I examined yesterday, said Sir David bluntly. I don't know that I've ever seen Stafford so tense. I thought he might break in too. Come to that, I don't know that I've ever seen him come down to have a look at a corpse before. Adam said nothing at first. He trusted Sir David and had worked with him often. But this matter was different. This was not a matter of facts or even of theories. This was politics and duty and the future of more people than himself, the love he felt for his office and his work. And so much more. And yet, Adam had seldom been so aware that he had no idea which direction to turn. The dead man is George Edwards, Adam said. He was a part of the Cato Street conspiracy, probably as a spy in the pay of the government. Standing in the yard of his mother's house, with the chickens and the geese squabbling noisily with each other, Adam told Sir David the whole of his involvement with the questions of Cato Street, High Treason, Sir Richard, George Edwards, Jack Beecham and John Stafford. Then he told the coroner how he had dined with Townsend the night before and been summarily ordered to Liverpool for his own good. Sir David gave out a long, low whistle. I wish there was something I could do to help you there, Harkness. Do you want me to speak to Mr Burney? He might listen. And what then? Adam asked. I may keep my posting, but I'd have won nothing but Stafford's suspicions and Townsend's. I'd spend the rest of my days wondering what way they'd find to finally do me in. He shook his head. I won't stay under those conditions. Well then, if you're in want of work, I'll do what I can. Adam frowned. I wouldn't, Sir David laughed. Of course you wouldn't. That's why I'm offering. I've got discretion in the men I hire on to help with my inquiries. You'll not get as much respect as being with Bow Street, and I'd only be able to pay you when there was actual work. But it would help tide you over until you found something steady. Adam found himself looking to the side door. What is it? asked Sir David. Just something my mother said. A man should always listen to his mother. Adam laughed. She'd be the first to agree with you. Will you take that cup of tea? Gladly, said Sir David. Much to Lady David's dismay, I left the house without mine this morning. But as Adam turned, he found himself face to face with Meg. Adam, was just coming to fetch you. Captain Gautier's inside, and he says he's got a message from Miss Thorne. There's trouble with a family called Leviton. Chapter 51 the effects of desperation. But you see that this is an affair of life and death. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda. The first light of London's faint, tardy dawn had barely begun to outline the rooftops when Rosalind and Kate arrived at Upper Brook Street. Rosalind had not intended to take Kate with her. Kate, however, firmly represented that she had no intention of staying behind. Rather than waste time arguing the matter, Rosalind hurried to rouse Amelia from her bed. Kate must be got dressed. Alice must also be woken and told all that had happened. Don't worry, Rosalind. I'll take care of everything here. Unless I hear something from George about Hannah and the baby, of course. Which was the best that could be done. Parsons, the footman, protested at being left behind. But Rosalind pointed out, politely but firmly, that he was needed to keep watch on the house and Alice and there might be additional errands to be run, or messages carried. Blessing Charlotte a hundred times in her heart, Rosalind climbed into the carriage with Kate, while the coachman touched up the horses. Now, Mariana's footman, Kinsley, hollow-eyed and half-dressed, opened the door and stood back, to let both Rosalind and Kate inside. "'Where is my mother?' demanded Kate. But she did not have to wait for an answer. The door to the front parlour was open, and through it they could see Beatrice slumped on the sofa. 
and Beatrice could see them. Beatrice rose, trembling so badly Rosalind feared she might fall. Kate's mother lurched forward, hands outstretched. Kate ran to Beatrice and caught her. The pair of them stood together, arms around each other, with Beatrice weeping inconsolably on Kate's shoulder. Rosalind quickly dragged the door shut and faced Kinsley. Where is Mrs. Mariana? Upstairs, miss. Rosalind raced up the winding stairs and arrived breathless on the second floor. To her relief, Mrs. Hepplewhite was standing outside the door to Mariana's apartments. I heard you arrive, miss, the nurse said as Rosalind reached her. Mrs. Mariana wants you to go into her at once. I will, said Rosalind. I need your help, however. What I am about to ask is outrageous, but we have no time for convention. What can I do, miss? Go to Mr. Leverton's house. Say that Mrs. Leverton sent you personally. Offer to assist with laying out the body and look at his injuries. I beg your pardon, cried the nurse. Please, said Rosalind urgently. I know this is entirely outside all propriety, but I also do not know when or if the coroner can be summoned, and it is very possible that Everett Leverton has been murdered. The desire to protest the request and the assertion flickered behind Mrs. Hepplewhite's eyes, but only for a moment. In plain truth, they both knew that if she had not already been suspicious, she would not have sent for Rosalind. I'll go fetch my cloak, she said. There is a carriage outside, Rosalind told her. You may tell the driver you are acting on my instructions. She would have to apologise to Charlotte for making blatant and extended use of what was supposed to be a much shorter loan. Rosalind did not waste time knocking on Mariana's door or even attempting to compose herself. She strode directly into Mariana's apartment and found the older woman sitting up in front of her fire. Miss Thorne, Mariana cried, thank goodness! Can you tell me what happened? Rosalind asked. Little enough, answered Mariana. We were awakened with a message from Wilhelmina. Everett had been found by the servants. When they woke to start work this morning, he had fallen down the stairs and his head was broken open. Mariana, I must beg your pardon for being so blunt, said Rosalind, but we have no time. Everett may well have been murdered. You can't be serious! Mariana blurted the words out and then shook herself. But of course you are. Good God, has the world gone mad? I cannot answer that, said Rosalind. Please, I need to make use of your writing desk, and I will need to send a servant to take a message. You may have all you need. Mariana waved her toward the desk by the window. But why would Everett be killed? The boy was feckless. Everett gathered and kept other people's secrets, said Rosalind, and they knew it. I may be wrong, but given all that has happened thus far, I think we must act as if it was murder before the perpetrator has time to cover over their traces. As the poisoner had done so well. Mariana heaved herself to her feet and grabbed for her stick. Mrs. Leverton, Mariana waved her off. Miss Thorne, you cannot expect me to sit quietly in this room when my nephew may have been done to death. No, she could not especially when it was beginning to appear that she had already made a colossal error in keeping so much to herself. Secrets were always the danger, even when she was the one who held them. Help me downstairs, Talmage, Mrs. Leverton snapped at her maid. Then you will come back up here. Miss Thorne is to have whatever she needs, and if anyone has a quarrel with this, you may send them to me. Rosalind heard the door shut, but did not look back. She found pen, ink and paper waiting on Mrs. Leverton's desk. She took a deep breath to bring some composure to her galloping thoughts and began to write. She addressed her first letter to the coroner, Sir David Royce. Rosalind had been of assistance to him in several cases of violent death. She had confidence he would listen to her when she said there was a matter he needed to attend to as soon as possible. Marcus Leverton would not be willing to answer her questions – or let anyone in his household answer them. He saw her as nothing but an oddity and a harpy in league with Mariana, whom he actively hated. He had already forbidden her the house, and she was not sure even this tragedy would provide her a way to regain entry. The coroner, however, had the authority of law to make an inquiry in all cases of sudden or unnatural death. Next, Rosalind wrote a letter for Adam. He would not have left town yet, the stage for Liverpool would not depart until noon. 
His word could bring a trustworthy man from Bow Street, Captain Gautier perhaps, or Mr. Torton, someone who would listen to her and believe what she told them. Rosalind left her letters and her instructions with the maid and hurried downstairs to the front parlour. Mariana stood beside the mantel, facing Beatrice and Kate, who sat on the sofa and held each other's hands. To Rosalind's surprise, they were not alone. Miss Thorne! Mr. Davenport swept off his high-crowned hat and bowed hastily. Wilhelmina sent me word at my club that I should come at once. He swallowed, more uncertain and pale than Rosalind had seen him before. I was delighted to find Mrs. Leverton so improved. From his face, he was also more than a little surprised. And now that you are here, you may accompany myself and Beatrice to Marcus's house, said Mariana. Miss Thorne... Kate cut Mariana off. I want to go too. I want to see him. Mariana levelled a hard, sceptical glower toward her, but Kate did not shrink away. Very well. Mariana gave a one-shouldered shrug. We will all go. Marcus will already be out of his wits, so I don't see how the whole party can make things worse. The carriage is being brought. Kinsley, she barked. We will all need our coats. The footman bowed and hurried away. Mr. Davenport turned to Kate. I'm glad you're safe, he said. Thank you, she replied, without getting up from her mother's side. I hope one day you'll decide to tell me the whole of what happened. Kate's gaze shifted from Mr. Davenport to Mariana to Rosalind. That will depend on what we find has happened to Everett. What do you mean, Kate? demanded Beatrice. He has had a fall. Wilhelmina's letter said there had been a fall. Yes, of course, said Kate, soothingly. But Rosalind knew Mr. Davenport did not miss the way her attention stayed focused on Rosalind. It was a slow drive to Marcus Leverton's house. Mariana kept an old-fashioned coach and four, which had the advantage of allowing the entire party to ride together. But even with four sturdy horses and a pair of link boys with torches, the driver was impeded both by the creeping morning fog and the market traffic filling the streets. The five of them sat in silence, doing little more than avoiding each other's eyes. Even Rosalind did her best to keep her attention pointed out the window. At last they reached the Leviton's house. Mr Davenport assisted Mariana to the door while Kate took charge of her mother. Rosalind plied the knocker. The footman, Morris, answered by the third knock. Mrs. Leverton, he bowed as they stepped inside, may I say how very sorry we all are. Thank you, Morris, said Mariana. Beatrice sagged against Kate. Footsteps sounded on the stairs overhead. Get them out of here, bellowed Marcus as he hurried down to the foyer. They have no business being here. Marcus, began Mr. Davenport. You as well, you parasitic bastard. Marcus barged past Mr. Davenport to his footman. I gave direct orders they were not to be admitted. At the sound of her husband's shout, Wilhelmina emerged in the hallway. Her carriage was straight, although her face was unusually pale. Marcus, please, Wilhelmina admonished as she hurried into the foyer. You must calm yourself. Calm myself? Marcus barked out a cold laugh. With this... This collection on my doorstep, with my brother dead in my house, with my wife, my wife turning against me. You do not know what you are saying, breathed Wilhelmina. Don't I, madam, he replied icily. How did Davenport even know to be here, hm? Answer me that. Marcus, stop this, gasped Beatrice. He is here because Mariana asked for him. I will not stop. Marcus roared. I am master in this house, and for once in my life, I will be listened to. Didn't Everett listen? inquired Kate. Is that what happened? Marcus went dead white and then flushed scarlet. You little enough! Mariana slammed her walking stick against the floor. We will not quarrel in the hall like a group of schoolchildren. Everett is dead. Beatrice is fainting, and the rest of you, I don't even know where to begin. Wilhelmina, is there a fire in the morning room yet? Wilhelmina nodded. Excellent. We will go there. Marcus, help me. She held out her arm for him to take. Marcus wavered. 
caught between anger and expectations. Rosalind remembered how Kate had spoken of Marcus's ingrained sense of honour, and that, it seemed, was what won over now. His expression was one of wordless fury, but despite that he took Mariana's arm and led her down the hallway toward the morning room. Kate supported her mother, with Mr Davenport close behind them. He looked over his shoulder at Rosalind. Rosalind nodded acknowledgement but did not move to follow. Her absence would be noticed shortly and she would be sent for. But for the moment she had been mostly forgotten. As soon as the family had vanished into the morning room, Rosalind turned to find a small elderly man in a black coat and trousers standing deferentially by the stairs. Are you the butler here? Rosalind asked him. Yes, miss. Dalton, he bowed. I've got the household together below stairs to await instructions and prevent idle chatter. I hope that will be satisfactory. Very, thank you. I will go upstairs and see to matters there. Sir David Royce, who is the coroner, may be arriving, or send a message shortly. If I am not down before then, please send for me. Yes, miss. And the family? Mrs. Marianna Leverton is taking matters in hand with the family. They are in the morning room. I'm sure there will be other orders soon. Just so, miss, agreed Dalton. I will see to them. If I may, asked Rosalind, were you aware, did Mr. Everett have any visitors yesterday? Dalton considered this question for a moment. No, miss, he said, with a bland professional politeness. Mr. Everett was home all day yesterday. I am not aware of any late visitors. Thank you, said Rosalind. Dalton bowed. Rosalind gathered up her hems and hurried up the stairs. All the way, she considered how a servant with a jealous and exacting master might be reluctant to speak with a stranger about the family's business, all the more so under such circumstances. She was also conscious of the fact that she had asked if Everett had had any visitors yesterday. Dalton, however, had taken time before he spoke, and then said there had been no late visitors. It occurred to her that these were not at all the same thing. Chapter 52 Causes and Repercussions of Death The unlawfulness arises from the killing without warrant or excuse. It may be by poisoning, striking, starving or drowning, and a thousand other forms. Impey, John, The Office and Duty of Coroners The hallway on the second floor was dark and still, but one door had been left open. Rosalind crossed through into a private sitting room, panelled in dark wood and furnished with club chairs and a leather sofa. A few books and a number of journals and ledgers had been left scattered about. Rosalind felt a tightness in her throat, walking through this remainder of Everett Leverton's life. The door to the boudoir was also opened. Through it, Rosalind saw Mrs. Hepplewhite moving about an old-fashioned bed hung with heavy velvet curtains. She saw the outlines of the corpse, laid out straight on the white bedclothes. She must have made some noise because Mrs. Hepplewhite glanced back and saw her. She grabbed up a ragged strip of towel to wipe her hands and came out into the sitting room, closing the door behind herself. What can you tell me? asked Rosalind. Mrs. Hepplewhite was plainly angry, and it was not at Rosalind's question. The poor young man's skull was broken, she said. In all my years, I'd only ever seen such a thing once before, and that person had been kicked by a cart horse. She paused, visibly attempting to retain control of her emotions. Miss Thorne, I do not want to say this, but I was told he was found at the bottom of the stairs. Rosalind nodded. Those stairs, Mrs. Hepplewhite gestured toward the door, they're steep, but not overly so. I would not have thought a simple fall would cause a man's skull to be damaged that way. I would have thought there would have to be help. Such as if he'd been pushed, said Rosalind evenly. Even then, said Mrs. Hepplewhite, my guess, if I may, would be that something struck his head, something heavy and quite solid. Thank you, Mrs. Hepplewhite, said Rosalind. I am sorry to have drawn you into this. Mrs. Hepplewhite shook her head. Such things should not be permitted, she said firmly. 
not in any household. No, agreed Rosalind, no, they should not. Mrs. Hepplewhite agreed to remain with Everett's body until the coroner could arrive. Rosalind, lost in her own chaotic thoughts, descended the stairs. Her skin crawled as she rested her hand on the railing, and try as she might, she could not bring the sensation under control. What do I say? What do I do? she asked herself the whole long way down. She reached the foyer and stopped. She blinked. Something was missing. The table, with its visiting book, and silver vase of hothouse flowers. The patterned rug underfoot. The rug would have been moved as soon as ever it was taken away. It would have to be scrubbed before the blood could set and stain. But what of the table and the vase? Rosalind had not thought it possible for disquiet to settle more deeply inside her. While she stared at the blank space where the table had been and willed some plan to form in her mind, a sharp rapping sounded on the front door. Rosalind looked about herself and realised there was no servant to be seen. Neither were they likely to have heard the knocker if, as Dalton told her, they were all gathered below stairs. Rosalind smoothed her skirt and went to open the door. Two men stood on the steps, and she knew them both. Sir David. Mr Harkness. Rosalind strove to conceal her surprise. Why are you here? she cried silently toward Adam as he stepped inside. You were meant to be gone already. Thank you for coming so quickly, she said. She could not seem to shift her gaze from Adam's face. He looked half determined, half apologetic. She did not understand what had happened, but she did know she was glad to see him. As it happens, your note found us together, Sir David was saying. What happened here? Rosalind wrenched her attention back to the coroner. One of the family members, Everett Leviton, was found by the servants early this morning. It appeared he had fallen down the stairs and died of it. Appeared? Sir David's shaggy brows arched. Rosalind nodded. He is upstairs now. You should find a Mrs. Hepplewhite in attendance. She is an experienced nurse and has what I believe to be some significant observations about the man's injuries. I see. Understanding sparked deep in Sir David's eyes. Well, it would seem you have, as usual, put all things in good order, Miss Thorne. I should properly speak to the master of the house first, but I believe in this case I will go see your experienced nurse. Will you tell the family that I have arrived and will attend them shortly? Certainly. Sir David nodded his thanks and started up the stairs leaving Rosalind alone for this moment with Adam. I'm glad to see you, she told him softly. It was maddening that she could not risk reaching out to take his hand, or even so much as touch his sleeve. But you should go now. Sir David will make sure all is in hand, and the stage for Liverpool leaves... Adam's answering smile was grim. I'm not going anywhere. Sir David has asked that I attend him as needed today. May I take it this matter is related to the poisoning? A thousand questions blossomed inside Rosalind, but she set them all aside. The truth is, I don't know. It may be entirely separate. That is a great deal of tragedy for one family, Adam remarked. Where is Miss Catherine? With her mother and the rest of the family in the morning room. All right. I'll go see about the servants. If you can deal with the family as you think best until Sir David can speak with them. Rosalind nodded. You should ask about a table and a heavy silver vase that used to be in the hallway. It may have been removed in order to be cleaned. She hesitated. I asked the butler if Everett had any visitors yesterday. He told me only that there had been no late visitors. I'm not certain this was the truth. The corner of Adam's mouth twitched. I will make particular note of that. Thank you, Mr Harkness, said Rosalind. Adam bowed. You are welcome, Miss Thorne. A green baize door waited on the right-hand side of the foyer. Adam ducked through it. Rosalind, unobserved for this one moment, closed her eyes and pressed her hand against her stomach. She stood this way until her breathing steadied. 
Then she opened her eyes and walked down the hallway. Inside the morning room, Rosalind found the Levitons and Mr Davenport arranged in an awkward live tableau. Mariana was seated alone with her back to the windows. With her imperious air and ebony walking stick, she looked like a queen before her court. Marcus had his back to the rest of the gathering. He stared out those same windows at the narrow spring garden with its burgeoning flowers and greening shrubs, a view entirely at odds with the winter chill that filled the room. Miss Thorne, said Wilhelmina, as soon as Rosalind entered, what, what can you tell us? Wilhelmina, snapped Marcus, you are not to speak with that creature. Then I'll do it, said Mariana. What can you tell us? Was that someone at the door? It was the coroner, said Rosalind, Sir David Royce. How did he get here? asked Mr Davenport. Marcus? Marcus's face twisted in an attitude of disgust. Don't be ridiculous. I sent for him, Rosalind told them. You dare, thundered Marcus. This is my house. And it is possible that murder has been done, replied Rosalind. Slander, bellowed Marcus. Why, inquired Kate. She didn't say you did it. For a moment, Rosalind thought Marcus was going to strike his sister. Mr Davenport evidently thought so too, because he stepped between them. Marcus, you have to collect yourself. Rosalind watched Marcus measure himself against the broader man, and remember that Mr Davenport had doubtlessly led a rougher life than Marcus himself ever had. Marcus took one step backward. I will see you in court, sir, he said, and his smile held an even sharper edge than his words. You and these harpies and anyone who dares side with you. You will all be held liable for your trespass and your slander, and that will be just the beginning. Are you including me in that threat? inquired Mariana. Marcus's eyes shifted. Oh, yes, aunt. I have had enough of your manipulations and predations on my family. While this threat still hung in the air, a knock sounded on the door, and it opened. Sir David stepped into the room. Mr Leverton, he said uncertainly. Marcus turned. After a moment's struggle, he managed to recover his gentleman's dignity. His expression smoothed and his shoulders straightened. I am Leverton, he said. The coroner bowed. Sir David Royce, at your service. I do apologise for the intrusion. If I might have a word with you. Marcus bowed and moved to precede the coroner out the door. Wait! Beatrice tore her hands out of Kate's and struggled to her feet. Wait, please, Sir, Sir David, uh, I, I haven't seen him yet. Please, may I see my son? I am so sorry, madam, said Sir David gravely. You certainly may, but I would not recommend you go alone. I'll go with her. Kate spoke stoutly, but her cheeks remained pale. We will go together. Mariana pushed herself to her feet. Come along, Beatrice. Kate. Mr. Davenport, you as well. You might be needed. The women and Mr. Davenport left together, with Kate once again holding tightly to her mother's hand. Rosalind watched them and then turned to see Wilhelmina. She held herself straight as a willow wand, and her eyes glittered. But it was not with grief or fear. Wilhelmina watched the Levitons leaving together, and she was jealous. Sir David, we may speak in my book room, Marcus was saying. Then, turning to his wife, he added, You had better see to the staff, had you not, Wilhelmina? She rose calmly. Yes, of course. Marcus opened the door and waited while Wilhelmina preceded the men from the room. As he did, he shot Rosalind a triumphant glance. Checkmate, it said, and you'll have nothing from my wife. The door closed and Rosalind was alone. She was tired and thirsty, and despite the fire and the thin shreds of sunshine that filtered through the fog, she was quite cold. She sat down on the tapestry sofa and prepared to wait. As she anticipated, she did not have to wait long. Barely five minutes by the mantel clock had passed before the door opened yet again, and Wilhelmina slipped inside. Miss Thorne, she said, I am sorry for my husband. I am sorry. Her breath hitched, a distressed hiccuping noise. 
How can I help you? Rosalind asked. I barely know. Wilhelmina wrung her hands. Her pale cheeks flushed, and she glanced over her shoulder. I don't even know how to speak of this. Rosalind waited. Last night I heard shouting outside my rooms, she said. I thought it must be Marcus. I almost did not go out. Rosalind imagined Wilhelmina lying in her bed, staring up at the canopy in worry and frustration, trying to decide what she should do. But in the end I did go into the corridor, and I saw... She stopped again. Rosalind kept her silence. I saw Marcus, she said. I saw him on the stairs with Everett. Marcus pushed him, Miss Thorne. Her voice faltered. Marcus pushed him, and he tumbled down into the foyer. He, Everett, moved to stand, but Marcus had grabbed the vase from the table, and, and, she shuddered again and pressed her hands against her face. You have helped other women in such difficulties, Miss Thorne. I beg you, help me now. She raised her face. Tears sparkled in her emerald eyes. I cannot. If I am not believed, and even if I am, I... What he might do to me. She swallowed. I'm afraid for my life. Rosalind reached out and took Wilhelmina's slender hand and felt how cold it was. I will do all that I can, promised Rosalind. But I have a question, and I must beg you to tell me the truth. Wilhelmina glanced over her shoulder at the door. It remained closed. She nodded. Did someone visit Everett late last night? She shuddered, and she dropped her gaze. Her face was so tightly drawn, she looked like some elfin creature rather than a human being. Her hand tightened around Rosalind's. Yes, she said. It was Mr. Davenport. Chapter 53 Difficult Conclusions Without that wrestling match of theirs, the truth might never have been dragged to the light. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda The carriage ride back to Mariana's home was tense and silent. Rosalind found herself helping Kate support Beatrice, who seemed unable to rally from her grief. Kate, pale and hesitating, held her mother's shoulders and tried to give what awkward comfort she could. Mr Davenport sat beside Mariana, but where the others were sunken into their individual grief and worry, Mr Davenport remained alert, watching all the women, trying to guess their secret thoughts. His round, clear eyes, Rosalind noted, turned most frequently to her. When they arrived at the Upper Brook Street house, Kate was able to give Beatrice over to the care of the maids to take upstairs, and her relief was palpable. Mariana faced her niece and Rosalind, leaning heavily on her stick, and plainly exhausted. Well, let's not stand here in the hall. She turned and limped through the nearest door, the formal parlour was filled with stiff, old-fashioned furniture. Neither fire nor candle had been lit. Mr Davenport hurried to Mariana's side so he could take her arm as she lowered herself into a mahogany and damask chair. Mariana did not protest this attention, which surprised Rosalind a little. Kate closed the door. Mr Davenport went to the drapes and pulled them back to allow what light and warmth the day had to offer. Kate rubbed at her face and her throat. Are you all right, Kate? asked Mr. Davenport. I don't know. I... she swallowed. I don't know, she repeated. I think it hadn't sunk in before. Everett, she breathed her mother's name. He tried so hard to make everything all right. I used to get angry at him. All I wanted was to escape. But he wanted to find some way to keep the family together. Not like Marcus... He just cares about appearances, about everything happening the way it was supposed to. Everett wanted there to be something real, a home, something. He was no good at it. He could be wrong-headed, but he tried, and I never did. She twisted her hands. Mr Davenport started toward her, possibly to try to offer some comfort, 
but she turned away from him just slightly, and he stopped where he was. Marianna tried to straighten her slumping shoulders and failed. Well, Miss Thorne, what do you recommend we do now? Rosalind considered. There is something else I believe you should know. Naturally, said Marianna blandly. Wait, said Mr. Davenport quickly. I think I may know what it is. You found out that I went to see Everett last night, did you not? Kate and Marianna turned to him, both startled, both accusing. What business did you have with Everett? demanded Marianna. He sent for me. He wanted to give me a warning, Mr. Davenport answered. He said he believed that Marcus was getting ready to file suit against me. For what? asked Marianna. Kate, Rosalind noticed, kept very quiet. Fraud, answered Mr. Davenport, and Kate started. So did Rosalind. Marcus apparently has bought some shares in the mines, Mr. Davenport went on. He believes he has evidence of improper speculation with corporate funds and embezzlement and a few other things. Mr. Davenport said all this very smoothly. He must have been readying the story for quite some time, Rosalind realised. Either that or Mr. Davenport was a very good liar, at least as good as Wilhelmina. That's all nonsense, said Marianna. We'll have it dismissed in ten minutes. Of course, replied Mr. Davenport, but Everett felt I should know. I left around midnight, and so you are aware, Miss Thorne, he added with studied blandness, Everett was very much alive at the time. I hope you told the coroner this, said Marianna. I did, said Mr. Davenport. Him and that fellow he had with him. He shrugged. Another man might have tried to hide his visit, I suppose, but that's not my way. No, indeed, murmured Rosalind. You should also know that before we left, Wilhelmina came to speak with me. Now it was Mr. Davenport's turn to be startled. But he quickly recovered his composure. Good heavens, he murmured. That took some nerve. Marcus does not like to be crossed. She told me two things. Rosalind went on. She said that you, Mr. Davenport, had come to visit Everett yesterday. She also said that she heard quarrelling in the middle of the night and that she witnessed her husband push Everett down the stairs. Marcus! cried Kate. She says Marcus killed Everett! Marianna narrowed her eyes at Rosalind. Do you believe her? She spoke very positively, Rosalind said. I do not know what Sir David will conclude about the injuries or what Mr. Harkness has heard from the servants, but Wilhelmina begged me to help her and said that what she saw has put her in fear of her life. Marcus would never hurt her, said Kate. He's jealous, but he loves her. In his way, she added. But there was doubt in her voice. But Marcus killing Everett. Marcus... She let the sentence die but Rosalind heard what she did not say. Marcus poison me. In a fit of temper he might do anything, muttered Marianna. Her hand trembled where it clutched her walking stick. I never believed I would say such a thing, but this is too much for me. I cannot think. She rubbed her brow. I am too old for this nonsense. You should rest, said Mr. Davenport. Let me take you upstairs. Kate, you can help us. If I may, interrupted Rosalind, Miss Leverton should come back to my house so she can pack her things and return here. Kate stared at her like Rosalind had suggested she fly to the moon. Are you serious? I am, Rosalind told her. I believe it will be of help to your mother and your aunt. Rosalind met her gaze and willed her to see there were still things that must be said between them but that they could not speak openly here. It was Marianna who settled the issue. Go with Miss Thorne, Kate, she said. Get your things. I will have your room put to rights, and no arguments, she added, as she got to her feet. I am done with arguments for today. Marianna loaned them her carriage for the drive back to Rosalind's house. Rosalind did not press Kate to talk with her along the way. Kate deserved some time to collect herself after all the shocks and grief of the morning, and Rosalind needed to recover her composure and to understand her own thoughts, and to decide what was true. 
How am I to decide what is true? Mr. Davenport was lying about his conversation with Everett. Wilhelmina was lying about what she had seen last night. Marcus was lying about his ability to harm those he felt had wronged him. One of them had tried to poison Mariana and Kate. One of them had murdered Everett. Was it the same person? Or had there been two persons acting for two separate reasons? Rosalind found she did not know and could see no path toward an answer. At last they arrived at home. Amelia was there to open the door and help Rosalind and Kate off with their things. Is Alice here? asked Rosalind. She's gone to her brother's. Amelia grinned broadly. The baby's come, a big strong girl they're saying, with a healthy pair of lungs. Mother and babe are both very hardy, she added, before Rosalind could ask. Relief, gratitude and delight rushed through Rosalind with a strength that came near to making her stagger. She suddenly remembered she'd had nothing to eat all day. That's wonderful, Amelia. Thank you, she paused. How are you doing? I'll be all right, miss, she said, and her voice was steady. We talked, Miss Alice and I, and we've sorted things out. Kate's cheeks paled a little, but to her credit she appeared able to set her feelings aside. Well, I had best go upstairs and get my things. I'm going home, Amy, she said. We'll be sorry to see you go, replied Amelia. Kate's mouth twitched. I doubt it, but thank you. Will you help me pack? Yes, miss, said Amelia. Rosalind watched the two of them start upstairs. Amelia, it seemed, had made her choice, and Kate appeared ready to accept it. Another wave of relief washed over Rosalind. Tired beyond measure, she took herself into the parlour and dropped gracelessly onto the sofa. What do I do now? She rubbed her hands together. Where do I even begin? She must have been sitting like that for some time, utterly lost in her tangled thoughts, because she was badly startled when Mrs. Singh pushed the door open. The cook came in carrying a heavily laden tea tray. Oh, but I didn't, began Rosalind. But you should. Mrs. Singh set the tray down in front of her. Miss Leverton tells me you've had nothing all day. You cannot continue without something to eat. Rosalind felt herself smile. You are quite right, of course. Thank you. Mrs. Singh nodded and left Rosalind there. Almost of their own accord, Rosalind's hands began to move, to pour the tea, to use the tongs to lay her preferred slice of lemon into the cup, to select a sandwich of fresh farm cheese and cress and lay it onto a plate. But instead of eating and drinking, she simply sat and stared at the tray. She wished Alice were here, or Adam. She wanted to talk to someone, to settle and sort her mad whirl of thoughts. Someone had poisoned Mariana and Kate. Someone had thrown Everett down the stairs. Wilhelmina said it was Marcus. Kate, by her actions and her intense surprise, said it could not be. Mariana wouldn't put it past him. Beatrice was insensible in her grief. Harold was concocting stories to cover up his true movements and behaviours. Mr Davenport and Wilhelmina were engaged in a romantic affair and Everett had known. Had Everett summoned Mr. Davenport to the house to threaten him, threaten them with that knowledge? Or could he have simply let it slip within Mr. Davenport's hearing, or Wilhelmina's? It was known that Everett made use of secrets in his keeping. Fear might have proved motivation enough for either Mr. Davenport or Wilhelmina to cause his death. But what of Mariana's and Kate's? How do I discover who tried to poison them when I cannot even say how one of the attempts was made? Rosalind fell back and squeezed her eyes shut. She wanted to sweep the tea things to the floor. She wanted to cry and scream and do any of a dozen things. She did not. She straightened herself so she would not be seen looking ridiculous if anyone came in. She addressed herself to her tray again. She took a bite of sandwich. She took a sip of lemon tea. She set her cup down. 
Mrs. Singh, well aware that someone, or indeed several someones, might join Rosalind, had provided additional cups and saucers. She had also included a jug of milk and the sugar bowl. Rosalind took up the bowl and cradled it in both hands. Memory assailed her. First, of Wilhelmina sitting in her beautifully appointed morning room, sipping her tea and answering her husband as he rapped out his suspicious intruding questions. Then, of Kate at breakfast, dropping lump after lump of sugar into her tea. The door opened. Rosalind's head shot up and she nearly dropped the bowl. Kate walked hesitantly into the room, followed closely by Amelia. I'm sorry, am I intruding? asked Kate. Not at all. Rosalind set the sugar bowl down hastily. Sit down. Will you have some tea? Thank you. Kate sat in the round-backed chair. Rosalind poured out the tea and gave the cup to Kate. She took up the tongs and dropped a sugar lump into her cup, and another, and a third. Amelia cleared her throat. For a moment, Rosalind thought she'd been caught staring at Kate's tea like a starving woman stared at a bread loaf. But as Kate blushed, it became clear that this signal was for her. Miss Thorne, Kate said. The first time Amelia said I should ask you for help, I did not, and I regret that. She took a swallow of her sweetened tea. I have been... I don't know what I've been. A fool. Selfish beyond words. Thoughtless beyond measure. All of that. More than that. Her eyes were dry as she spoke. There was no sign of the weighing and judging that Rosalind had seen before when she was trying to see which lie was most likely to be believed. I know you have no reason to believe me. She stopped and swallowed. But I need you to try. I don't know what Wilhelmina said she saw, or thinks she saw, but whoever might have pushed Everett, it isn't Marcus. Rosalind waited. Kate put her cup down. I can't believe I'm saying this. She was speaking to the walls, the fire, the chair, anywhere but Rosalind. It was as if she thought that by looking at another person she would lose courage. Marcus is cold, unimaginative and a fool. But he's a coward. That's what our father did to him. And to Everett. Her voice wavered. And me. But he's honourable as well. He believes all that nonsense about how a gentleman is supposed to conduct himself. If he pushed Everett, if Everett fell, Marcus would be the first to confess. I don't know who tried to kill Mariana, or me, or who did kill Everett, but it was not him. She stuck her chin out. I know what I am, Miss Thorne, and I know what I've done, but I will not have my small-minded, stubborn, selfish, older brother hang for something he didn't do. Rosalind looked past her to Amelia, waiting, as ever, beside the fireplace. Do you believe her? Kate bit her lip. Amelia walked forward, one step, two steps. Kate raised her eyes and met the challenge in Amelia's hard, canny gaze. They stayed like that, immobile, silent, with the anger and tension of years of love and betrayal singing between them. At last, Amelia nodded. Yes, miss. Rosalind nodded as well. As a matter of fact, I also believe you, Kate, and I agree with you. Kate started. You do? Yes. There was no way in which Mariana's death would or could benefit Marcus. Your death would only ensure that the affair between Mr Davenport and Wilhelmina would continue unimpeded. That is assuming, of course, Marcus knew for certain about the affair. Even then he might have viewed your marriage as a benefit to him. Because Harold would stop pursuing Mina, put in Kate incredulously. As if anyone would choose my looks over hers. But once you two were married, Harold would have control of a substantial fortune. Marcus could then sue for criminal conversion and demand large damages. If he won, he would have revenge on Wilhelmina and Harold for embarrassing him, as well as on Mariana by gaining the fortune she had denied him. Kate stared blankly at her for a moment, and then pressed her hand against her mouth. Oh, good Lord, that's exactly what he would do too. 
Rosalind nodded. So, even if Everett did tell him about the affair, or Harold's parentage, or any other secret, nothing would change from Marcus's point of view. Indeed, he would have every reason to keep Everett alive. As a witness at trial, said Kate. Yes, agreed Rosalind. He could demand a damage so large it would land Mr Davenport in debtor's prison from his inability to pay. And we know that Mariana would well refuse to rescue Mr Davenport because she abhors an unfaithful man. But Harold can't be the poisoner either, said Kate. Without our marriage he'd get nothing from Mariana, and he'd have no cover to continue meeting Wilhelmina. So that leaves... Kate swallowed. Good God! Rosalind nodded. How would we ever prove such a thing? cried Kate. There's not a man living who will look at her and believe she would harm a fly. That is not strictly speaking true, said Rosalind. But you are right, we need proof. And that proof does not exist. Yet. She set her own cup down and folded her hands. Tell me, Miss Leverton, she said conversationally, exactly how good of a liar are you? Chapter 54 Polite Fictions Nor can it be my wish to extort from you any mortifying confessions. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda Hello, Wilhelmina, said Kate, as she breezed into the morning room. It was early morning, just on the cusp of the time for visiting hours. Rosalind and Kate had talked for several hours the day before and eaten the entire contents of Mrs Singh's tray. Rosalind had written several urgent letters. She'd even managed to get a night's sleep, although a fitful one. She'd kept waking to wonder if she should have put her plan into place immediately. So many things could go wrong in the darkness. Adam sent no word. Neither did Sir David. The only note Rosalind got was from Alice, saying she would stay another night, although the flat was so full of Hannah's female family she was fairly sure she'd have to sling a hammock to have a place to sleep. Kate? Miss Thorne? Wilhelmina stared at them both from her place on the sofa. Then she saw Amelia follow them into the room, and genuine shock overtook her. She pressed her hand against her stomach. Amelia made no sign that she had been noticed, or that she even recognised Wilhelmina. She just took her place beside the hearth, the picture of the perfect anonymous housemaid, silent and attentive, with lowered eyes. Rosalind pretended to ignore her movements, as was expected with regard to servants. I apologise for calling so early. We do not mean to stay long, she told Wilhelmina. Wilhelmina looked from Rosalind to Kate and back again. She clearly wanted to point out she'd given orders that she was not at home. She wanted to ask how they had been admitted at all to the house when Marcus had forbidden them absolutely. But Marcus had left, presumably for the day. Rosalind had watched him go before she and Kate had knocked on the door. She also knew that the footman had been given instructions to admit them, despite what had been said previously. "'You must forgive me,' said Wilhelmina. "'It's only that I am very tired,' after everything that has happened. And there is so much to do, and Marcus has gone to speak to his solicitor and left it all to me. She made a show of taking a deep breath and gathered her tattered nerves. What is it I can do for you? Oh, we're just here to congratulate you, said Kate, brightly. This also startled Wilhelmina, almost as bad as Amelia's presence. I beg your pardon? On your scheme, Kate went on. It really is quite remarkable. I thought I'd learned a thing or two about such tricks. She plopped down into the nearest armchair. The movement was bold and rude, as they had not been invited to sit. But yours, Mina, is positively exquisite. Wilhelmina frowned. Somewhere she'd learned to add a layer of dignity to her bright beauty, and the effect was imposing. Kate, I don't know what you're going on about, but really I have a terrible headache. And since Beatrice is not here, nor, I expect, even capable of rising from her bed, I am left. You have so much to do, yes! Kate winked at Rosalind. Rosalind allowed her eyes to narrow ever so slightly. So you said! 
Does that include telling the coroner what you told Miss Thorne about Marcus murdering Everett? Do you intend to plead for Marcus's life? It would be a nice touch, considering you're the one sending him to the gallows. For one heartbeat, anger blazed in Wilhelmina's eyes, but it was quickly swallowed by shock and outrage. I spoke in confidence, Miss Thorne, she cried. I begged for your help. You did, said Rosalind. And it was possible I might have believed you, but I had a piece of information that did not figure into your calculations. I don't understand. Wilhelmina pulled a handkerchief from her sleeve and pressed it to her eyes. I already knew you had poisoned Kate and Mariana. Wilhelmina froze stone still. Her hand shook as she lowered it. What? You tried to poison Mariana, said Kate, and me, with arsenic. You're wrong, breathed Wilhelmina, or you're lying. Her hand trembled again. Or you're stark, raving mad. I don't know which, but I think you had better leave. But Kate just continued to smile. Do you know, Wilhelmina, staying with Miss Thorne has been a marvellous education. Her sideways glance turned positively admiring. Rosalind herself was tempted to believe the emotion was real. I'm a thief, Kate went on. Marcus will have told you all about that. But Miss Thorne has taught me how much better it is to have information rather than jewels. There's so many ways gossip can be turned into money, you see. She clasped her hands. You do see, don't you, Wilhelmina? How could I possibly? answered Wilhelmina coldly. Oh, dear, Kate sighed to Rosalind. You did say she would not be inclined to drop her pose quickly. What pose? demanded Wilhelmina coldly. Kate, truly, you have to leave. I have too much to do to deal with your nonsense. Miss Thorne, please, you are a rational woman. And she knows a remarkable amount about all sorts of things, put in Kate cheerfully, including the fact that when there's a murder in the family, you only need to look for who had the most to gain. Wilhelmina's jaw tightened. At first, I thought that in our particular case it must mean Harold. I mean, if he and I had got married and I died afterward, he'd be both rich and free. You two could have run off together. Kate grinned saucily as Wilhelmina drew herself up. But then I thought how much better it would be if he was rich and free and you were a blubbering widow. Then no one would have to run anywhere. You could just get married. So, obviously, the thing to do would be for Harold to marry me and then cause me and Mariana to die in short order and you could both blame Marcus for it. She spread her hands triumphantly. Very tidy. Very efficient. Very Harold. He's not, as you know, like other men. She shook her head. Except there was one thing. Well, two things, really. Kate waited. Wilhelmina clearly knew she was expected to ask what this other thing might be, but she seemed determined to express her strong disapproval by maintaining her silence. Kate rolled her eyes at Rosalind and then leaned forward. Miss Thorne worked it out. You see, while Mariana was clearly meant to die slowly, I was meant to die quickly, and Harold and I weren't even married yet. And then, well, she shrugged, I know Harold rather well and he would never kill his own mother. Wilhelmina's hands clenched into fists, but instead of speaking, she reached for the bell. I would not recommend it, said Rosalind. There is more to be said. There is nothing more I wish to hear. Not even if it will save your life, inquired Kate. The courts take a very dim view of lady poisoners, however pretty, and I expect even Marcus will be somewhat nonplussed when he hears all this, he may even forget to defend you as his property. Wilhelmina lowered her slender hand. Do you honestly believe my husband would believe a single word from either one of you? Oh, I'm sorry, you misunderstand, said Rosalind. We do not mean to tell Marcus. Kate's grin turned positively feral. We're going to tell Mariana. Wilhelmina's face went dead white. Mariana employed me to find her poisoner said Rosalind. Finding Miss Leverton was something of a ruse, so I could continue that inquiry. Uh, what do you call it, Miss Leverton? A cover, supplied Kate cheerfully. 
And while I'm not at all trustworthy, Miss Thorne is the soul of honesty and discretion, and everybody knows it. She will be extremely sorry and reluctant to have to give your name to Aunt Marianna. It is all a lie, spat Wilhelmina. Whether it is or is not doesn't matter, said Rosalind. Because when I tell Marianna, and Kate confirms it, she will believe. And you will find yourself in a great deal of difficulty. Wilhelmina drew herself up straight. Her green eyes flashed in anger. But that anger was caged. Rosalind read her frustration in her clenched fists and the pallor of her cheeks. What do you want? she asked quietly. Kate nodded in approval. You were right, Miss Thorne. She did come around to our way of seeing things. Rosalind smiled and dropped her gaze in a show of modesty. Before we get into the question of price, we need to know how much you've told Harold, said Kate. He'll have to be dealt with as well. I did not tell him anything, said Wilhelmina. He would never have agreed to it. He would have us all continue as we are, with me having to endure Marcus and all his suspicions, living in constant fear of him throwing me into the street. Her lovely smile turned into a sneer. I would spend my life dependent on his generosity, cowed and looking over my shoulder, living for the love of him and trusting he would continue to care for me. Oh, yes, she said, and each word dripped with disdain. Such a fine life that would be. She leaned forward. Kate, you understand what it is to have to take your own freedom. You cannot blame me. I only did what I had to. But you also killed Everett, said Rosalind quietly. You pushed him, and you used the vase to break open his skull. Yes, agreed Wilhelmina evenly. I still need Harold. You see, they might not convict Marcus. And if they don't, you mean to try to give them Mr. Davenport? It is not what I want, said Wilhelmina. None of it. But it was that, or live trapped. You understand, Miss Thorne. You understand, Kate. I only... The door opened. Wilhelmina's chin jerked up. She had not seen Amelia move, because one did not pay attention to the movements of servants. She had not seen Amelia's hand turn the doorknob. But now, Wilhelmina saw Marianna standing at the threshold, leaning heavily on Mrs. Hepplewhite's arm. She saw Adam Harkness right behind them. Marianna shook her nurse off and shuffled into the room until she stood face to face with her daughter-in-law. Why didn't you tell me how it was? she asked. Why didn't you say you could not live in this house any more? Wilhelmina laughed once, a sharp, harsh sound. And what would you have done? Tears shone in Marianna's eyes. Whatever I could. Epilogue. Futures. Imperfect. But the danger is over. You need not look so terrified. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda. On April 14th and 15th of the year 1820, eleven men were tried and convicted of high treason in the Cato Street conspiracy. During the trial, a hastily printed, entirely anonymous pamphlet was distributed, accusing the ministers of having hired a spy to incite the men to violence. Sir Richard Phillips waved the pamphlet about during a fiery speech in Parliament and demanded the trial be halted and a new investigation carried out. Some suspected the gossip writer and novelist A. E. Littlefield of being behind the subversive writing, but nothing was ever proved, nor was there any consensus on where Littlefield could have got such accurate details about how the men came to be captured. Two days after this, Wilhelmina Leverton was tried and convicted for the murder of her brother-in-law and the attempted murder of her sister-in-law and her husband's aunt. After this verdict was rendered, her husband, Marcus Leverton, shut up his house and departed London, without leaving any forwarding address. Harold Davenport also left town quietly and without any fanfare. 
He returned to Cornwall with the stated intent of putting the business of the Leviton mines into good order, after which he planned to depart for Canada to seek new opportunities there. Also, quietly and without any fuss, Catherine Leviton returned to her aunt's house to help care for her mother and to try to sort out what she meant to do with the rest of her life. While Kate unpacked her bag and resettled herself into her room, Mariana invited Rosalind to take tea in her private sitting room. "'Well, Miss Thorne, I believe I owe you a great deal,' said Mariana, as she poured the tea with a steady hand and added the slice of lemon that Rosalind preferred. "'And more than just the amount your man arranged. I am glad I was able to be of use.' Mariana leaned back in her tall chair and cocked her head in an attitude Rosalind had come to understand meant that she was keenly examining the situation in front of her. "'I have a mind to invest in you,' she said. "'I beg your pardon?' Mariana smiled. "'While I was cooped up in here waiting to see if you would discover who wanted me dead, I had to do something to keep occupied. So I spent some of that time writing letters to people who know you personally.' including Honoria Amesworth. Rosalind found her tongue had frozen to the roof of her mouth. Everything I have heard is that you are honest, diligent, and very, very successful at this innovative profession of yours, and that you are increasingly busy, she added. I must say I entirely approve of the existence of someone willing to help the women of London with their private difficulties. Rosalind drew herself up. She readied herself to thank Mariana for the compliment, but Mariana was far from done. But it occurred to me that there are those who might need your assistance who are not necessarily able to afford the fees that you must charge. Women such as Amelia McGowan, for instance, or Kate. Rosalind found she did not know what to say to this. Mrs. Leverton nodded, as if she had been fully answered. Therefore, I propose that I and a few friends I know of should invest in your business. Such investment will provide you with the means to hire what assistance you may from time to time require and to meet such other expenses as your business may occur. We will expect reports, of course, but that is a matter we can go over as discussions progress. The contract will also stipulate that you, at least occasionally, help those who face difficulties but are unable to pay. An investment contract between a group of women, Rosalind murmured. Is such a thing even allowed? Mariana's smile turned sour. I'm sure if men in power are allowed to learn of its existence, they will object most strenuously. Questions may be raised in Parliament. She shrugged. Therefore, we will regard it as a matter of private correspondence, and I will have to rely on you to keep your word. Will you keep your word, Miss Thorne? Rosalind met her twinkling gaze. I have never yet broken my word once I have given it. Very good, said Mariana. We shall drink to it. Your health, Miss Thorne. She raised her cup. Your health, Mrs. Leverton, replied Rosalind solemnly. They drank and they laughed and talked of the future for quite some time. After that, there was only one thing left to do. Where's Amelia? asked Adam, as Rosalind let him into the house. It was evening. Rosalind had sent a message from Mariana's to Mrs Harkness, asking for Adam to call. He had responded promptly, as she had known he would. Amelia's gone to look at rooms with Alice. She's given me her notice, you know. Rosalind led Adam into the parlour. The drapes were closed against the encroaching evening, and the lamps and the fire lit. The room was warm, and filled with a comfortable glow. I take it then she received the bank draft for her finder's fee, Adam asked. Rosalind nodded. I was afraid she was going to faint when she saw it. We knew it would be substantial, but none of us expected three hundred pounds. Has she said what she might do with the money? She's thinking of opening a school for women and girls who want to leave service, to teach them reading and figuring, and how to present themselves and so forth. I imagine Alice will be a great help with that. I imagine so, agreed Rosalind. Adam looked about mildly. What of Mrs Singh? he asked. I've already sent her home for the day, Rosalind told him. Which meant the house was empty, save for the two of them.
Adam's brows rose. So, here we are. So it would seem, she agreed. And you have left Bow Street. I have. I could no longer do what was required of me. What does your mother say to that? Adam sighed. My mother says she wishes she could get hold of Mr. Stafford and Mr. Townsend and give them a piece of her mind to feast upon. She further suggests they would have indigestion for a month. I'm sure she's right, said Rosalind. What will you do now? I don't know, he admitted. Sir David says he can make use of me as one of his men, but that will only be occasional work. What do you want to do? He sighed. I want to be the man my family needs, that you need. I want you and I to be able to choose what we will be to each other without being forced into one role or another by the rest of the world. And for yourself? I expect I want much the same as you. I want to be useful. He stepped closer to her. And I want to ask you, what of us, Rosalind? Slowly she took his hand marvelling, as always, at the contained strength of it. Daring and lost in her own impulse, she kissed the back and pressed it against her cheek. Adam reached out with his other hand and ran his fingers down her temple. She shivered at the warmth of his touch and the casual ease with which she accepted that he should touch her and that she should invite it. We cannot continue as we are, she said. He did not answer her. It was not a question. If we marry, if we marry, I cease to exist, she said. Everything I have built, everything I have become, it is gone because by the law only one of us exists, and that's you. I trust you, she added. I know, but I do not know how to trust this world of ours. He turned his hand to cup her jaw. Rosalind found herself closing her eyes to better savour the sweetness of his touch. Then we must trust each other. I have a proposal, she said. A proposal, murmured Adam, caressing her chin ever so slightly. She nodded. Her mouth had gone very dry. How, how would you feel about working for me? Adam's hand stilled. For you? Rosalind nodded again. She took his hand from her jaw and held it. With me, perhaps, would be the better phrasing. You said Sir David will continue to have need of your expertise, and Mrs Leverton suggested I take on some help for the work that I do. I cannot think of anyone better than you. Adam stared, and Rosalind felt a knot of fear forming under her heart. But slowly, his surprise melted, and she saw the light of possibility in the depths of his eyes. We would stand a very good chance of rubbing roughly up against each other, Adam stopped. Perhaps I should find another way to put that. Perhaps you should, said Rosalind, her voice dry. But I find I do not mind the idea so very much. He took a step closer. You do not. No? She tilted her face towards his. Not in the least. The End You've been listening to The Secret of the Lady's Maid by Darcy Wilde Narrated by Ruth Redman Published by W. F. Howes Limited This recording is copyrighted by W. F. Howes Limited